Hello, I'm John Neff, Global Editor-in-Chief of Motor One, and welcome to this week's edition of the MotorOne.com podcast. Well, the day is almost here. It's about one week until the debut of the all-new mid-engine Chevy C8 Corvette. This is the most anticipated new car uh, of the year, bar none. It's big news anytime a new Corvette is unveiled, but this time, Chevy's iconic sports car is finally switching to a mid-engine layout after decades of teasing. Today, we're going to discuss everything we know about the new C8 Corvette and its debut next week, and I've got the perfect co-host for it. Joining me is MotorOne.com writer and our in-house C8 expert, Christopher Smith. How are you, Chris? Hi, I'm doing good. And also with us is the, is the man who'll be attending and covering the C8's debut for us next week, editor and video producer, Clint Simone. How are Counting you doing, Clint? Counting down the days, John. Counting down the days. Exactly. And to be clear, when this uh, we're recording on a Thursday, we're exactly one week from the debut. It's happening uh, next Thursday. What's the, what's the date? The 18th? That's right. 18th. I, I want to get started uh, in our conversation about the C8 a, a little differently. I want to pull pull the curtain back. I want to show people a little bit behind the scenes of what this uh, debut, what this this lead up to this car uh, has been like for automotive journalists. It it hasn't been the same old same old. Uh, and I'll give a description of what a typical car debut is. A typical car debut could be anything from um, an automaker, you know, sending us a press release and photos with no notice. Maybe, you know, we might not have any idea a car debut is coming and we just get an email and have to report on it. Normally, though, we do know a car is being debuted ahead of time, like we have for the, the C8 Corvette. And usually automakers, you know, release some teasers. Usually there are some spy shots. And if we're really interested, somebody might make a rendering of it. And normally a new car debuts at an auto show. Um, and it's always uh, anyone's guess which car uh, debut at an auto show might be the biggest. But every automaker is hoping theirs is uh, because they want to steal as much of the spotlight from the auto show as possible. Even rarer is when a car debuts outside an auto show and it's its own event. A, a car has to be really significant to get that sort of treatment. Uh, but it does happen. Um, this one is different, though, because I can tell you, and and Chris, you noticed this just this week uh, when we were you were writing uh, yet another uh, post for Motor One on the C8 that we had officially reached 100 posts that we've written about the C8. Oh, I'm pretty sure we're over 100, actually. Uh, we Definitely. Have our, we have our tag that we use that we hit 100. But when you go back, um, and we actually, uh, I don't know if you know this, John, our first C8 Corvette spy photo sighting was all the way back in 2016. It was like summer of 2016. Wow. So, you, so we got expect. stuff 2016, 2017. I mean, I don't even think we were using the tag at that point yet. In fact, I think 2016, John, even predates when you were at Motor One. So It might. It might. It, that so, was I very mean, early on in the site. So it's uh, it's just been going and going. So, the you know, we've been writing about this car for three years now. We've written well over a hundred articles about it before it's even debuted. And that's a record for us that, you know, I can tell you having managed this site since almost the beginning that I don't think there's been this much anticipation for a vehicle to date uh, while Motor One has been around at least. Um, you know, I, I can actually remember because uh, I've, I've been in the auto journalism game for a couple of decades now. I was at the debut of the C6 Corvette. And it was at a venue. It was during the Detroit Auto Show, but it was uh, they actually debuted it the night before the show um, at an offsite venue, like some theater or something. What I remember in particular about it was they gave everyone who attended like um, a, a scale model of the C6 Corvette. And it was like a fairly decent size. It was like, you know, a foot long, like real nice die cast model. Uh, and the the person I was working for at the time he left a little early and grabbed like four of them on the way out. And, <laughs> and then we saw them on eBay like immediately and they were going for hundreds of dollars. But, you know, uh, like I said in the intro, anytime a new Corvette uh, is unveiled is a big deal. I mean, there's only been seven generations to date. This will be the eighth. Um, but this one in particular is the switch to the mid engine layout. And this has been something people have talked about, regarding the Corvette since, I mean, how far does that go back to, Chris? It goes back to the 60s. We're literally talking about something that's been half a century in the, in making. the making. And 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 I mean, that's, that's a bit of a hyperbole there. This design didn't actually start 
50 years ago, but the idea started 50 years ago. And through the years, there have been hints and and examinations been- and prototypes. There have been a few actual GM prototypes of a, a mid-engine Corvette, like the Corvette Indy. The, uh, uh, I think the Serve was in there. Uh, yes. Uh, I think, isn't it the Serve 3 that was the blue one? I I think so. I'd have to I'd have was, to go back that, into my archives. I did. I just I just looked it up. That is one of the most that I remember from like from like growing up. That's the 1990s Serve Three Corvette. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it was a mid-engine Corvette concept. One of the most beautiful cars ever made. It was a concept, but honestly, it looked like it could have rolled into production. Right, and and I I remember back then there was even some talk that hey the the C five this might be the C five. Well, we know it wasn't the C five, but <laughs> and that, it wasn't that, the C six. And it, it wasn't, wasn't the C seven. Right, but but the uh, that little nugget has always been there um, over the last fifty years. So when you say there's some anticipation for this car. It's like, yeah. And the buildup is decades, decades long. Right. I think the only other car to rival this this year was the Supra. And we saw the Supra in January. And that is a big deal because it's the return of an icon. This is not the return of an icon. This is taking an icon and turning it upside down on its head and completely reimagining what it is. So with that comes this unparalleled level of excitement. Uh, and I remember earlier in the year, we talked about just hitting super fatigue. I don't know if I'm at mid-engine Corvette fatigue. We I don't know it. that that exists. Like, like we I don't have know tested either. the it's limits. Just, for as much <laughs> as we know, there are so many questions left unanswered that it's just going to be exciting. It, it's going to be exciting to see how they take a completely new angle at something like Chris said that is decades long unchanged and, and sort of just improved upon it. And now you're really starting from square one again, so to speak. And I'm glad you brought up Super because, and John, you've been saying that this is very different from the journalist side. Um, you're absolutely right. We had Super fatigue because Toyota gave it to us. They dropped so many teasers, so many events, right, so right. many things that Toyota did. GM, though, they've really done nothing. Hardly, this yeah, they, this they has have, all been on the enthusiast side, all the renderings right. that we've been getting the talk. Um, that I, I saw a comment uh, on one of our corporate articles, I'm, I'm guessing from a from a Supra fan that was saying, no, nah, the Supra debut was much bigger. Here's where yeah. it's different. Toyota was driving the hype on that for the Corvette. The enthusiasts, yeah, the people GM, are driving the hype. GM has been almost hands yeah. up. We have like they haven't had to lift a finger. Two teasers right, right. and one official announcement that, oh, hey, we're going to reveal this Corvette. They did, they did show the prototype, uh, the camouflage prototype. Yeah, they but drove only, it through Times Square. Only, so that was their sort of big stunt. Right. But um, that was only after we had seen that same camouflage prototype a hundred times. A million right, times, yeah. In, in spy and photos. that was to announce the actual unveiling date for the car. So it right. was yeah, very purposeful the way they did that. So yeah, most of our coverage, uh, most of those 100 plus articles have been uh, lots of spy photos. We, we've covered, we've, we've published spy photos of the prototype in every state of undress. Um, and at this point, they're running it around with just camouflage and no cladding or anything to hide lines, just camouflage to make it harder for you to tell what the exact lines are. Um, but what I've found so interesting about the the c8 corvette is that we've had so many renderings so many people on their own some some amateurs some some professional designers um take the spy photos and 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 turn them into renderings Uh, not only have we had dozens and dozens of renderings of every version of the c8 corvette you can imagine from the regular to the to the convertible to the z06 version to the racing version but We've even had people make 3D animated <laughs> renderings. I know, where and, like, and it's like it it just it blows my mind that they're putting this kind of time into it. And I, I mean, it's not rinky dink either. Like the 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 3D video that we had of the Corvette convertible sitting in a guy's driveway. It's like okay, it was great. It was a great. The, video. the top is going down while yeah. the camera is walking around the car, and oh look, that's somebody's house in the background. It's it's like I, I'm sorry, super guys. The super is awesome. But the, there wasn't any kind of excitement like this for the Supra. Well, I think the only car that could rival the anticipation of a new Corvette is a new Mustang. However, 
the the that would be in 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 a normal circumstance. The fact that it's switching to a mid engine layout makes this Corvette unveiling unlike any other. I think right. that's why the anticipation is so high. I mean, obviously, we're never going to see a Mustang switch to a mid engine layout. Although we Don't might see an electric, that. we Don't might see an electric that. Mustang pretty soon. <laughs> never so. say never. We might see a Mustang we have no SUV. Idea. <laughs> Mustang has exactly so, so yeah if that happens maybe maybe we'll see this type of enthusiasm and anticipation again but um but yeah to to date this is one of the most anticipated new car debuts I have ever witnessed the lead up to and participated in and it's been fun I mean it's it's fun to just keep talking about it oh, yeah. uh, and it's fun that the readers and everyone out there is still so interested in it so let's let's move on and actually talk about what we know because um, there's you know it's a week away but there's still a lot we don't know so Chris you've written actually written and updated uh, the article for us the everything we know article on motor one about the c8 let's let's start there what can you tell us that that we know for sure and so, and what we know that's kind of um, reasoned and educated speculation. Right. And uh, and just for our listeners out there, this Everything We Know article has literally just been updated this morning. Um, it should be in the main cycle at the motor1.com homepage. So you can reference that. Um, kind of going down that article, we will start with the engine. Obviously, the engine is behind the driver now instead of in the front. We heard conflicting reports for quite a while that okay it's either going to be a 6.2 liter uh push rod like the like the current corvette has or it's going to switch to the double overhead cam right now it looks like and again this isn't officially confirmed but all indications point to this being the 6.2 liter v8 push rod engine tweaked to fit behind the driver instead of the in the front um it should have a little bit more horsepower right now that uh that lt1 makes 460 horsepower in the base corvette reports are saying that this should have around 500 whether it's 500 exactly whether it's a little under we probably won't know until next week um and the changes will also probably make this engine the lt2 as opposed to the lt1 so that's that should be the engine that launches in the base corvette now Going forward, uh, I mean, we've heard reports for the last couple of years that there, there's going to be the new double overhead cam engine in there, uh, possibly related to Blackwing. Although we just had a report the other day that said, um, I think it was from uh, from Mark Russ at GM, that uh, they haven't actually put the Blackwing engine in the C8 prototype yet. But just for those who don't know, the Blackwing engine is a Cadillac engine that right. Cadillac has maintained will only ever be put in Cadillac engines. However, it is a a serious motor that just from what we've heard would sound, you know, would be really cool in the Corvette. But for now, as far as we know, Cadillac is keeping a tight grip on that and it won't end up in the Corvette. Even though it's actually built in Bowling Green, you know, it's, there's, it's just like, <laughs> there, there's so many um, consistencies there. It's, it's a 4.2 liter V8. Rumors said that the, the Corvette could have a 4.2 liter double overhead cam V8. Um, that recent report that I was referencing about GM, he said the Blackwing engine hasn't been in the Corvette yet, but it, I don't think it, uh, I don't think he mentioned a double overhead cam engine being right. In the yeah. Yet. <laughs> and, and there's a, there's a particular spy video that we, that we saw, uh, it was about a year ago. Um, of the C8R, the, the racing model. Um, and I'm sorry, that car does not have a push rod in it. When you hear it go by, it, yeah, sounds, you know. it sounds unlike any other racing Corvette you've ever heard. So when they say, uh, we haven't put the Blackwing engine in there yet, uh, I I'm I would bet a million and five dollars that's how confident i am a million five <laughs> that that's some version they, of it they, has they, have, been in there. they have prototypes out there with at least a double overhead cam engine that could be a 4.2 liter we've heard there's also a 5.5 liter um Ooh. twin turbos flat plane crank v8 and yes we've also heard and it seems fairly likely that at some point there'll be a, a all-wheel drive hybrid version that could have a thousand horsepower or more it's going to be the the corvette to end all corvettes and honestly i can't wait to see that show up yeah that'll be amazing i mean i i think five ten years ago it, you know if you had mentioned a hybridized 
Corvette, people would have uh, gotten visibly angry. But nowadays, <laughs> where you have the hypercars uh, being hybrids or plug-in hybrids and showing how effectively you can oh, use yeah. electric, electric motors on the non uh, non driven the, the on the wheels that the engine are driving, it's it's not only is it a great way to put power on those wheels and and control it very um, specifically. Uh, but it's also a cheaper way than making an actual like um, mechanical all-wheel drive right. uh, connection between the two axles. So um, I think that's a really exciting prospect. Um, we're not, we're probably not going to hear anything about that at the debut. The debut is probably going to be just the base Corvette, whether they right. call it Stingray uh, again or not. We don't know, but or Zora, uh, Zora could be another name. These are all you know down the road. The the next Corvettes to debut. Um, I'm not even certain we'll get horsepower specs is that crazy to say it's it's yeah. not crazy to say um i mean look at the gt500 um ford unveiled the shelby gt500 back in january and well it was just in the last yeah. month we finally got a horsepower figure right, right i i suspect though if they don't give us a definitive horsepower figure they will at least give us a range you know you know over 460 horsepower right sure. it's 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 and, and I guess another thing we can talk about here, uh, we've heard lots of rumors that production will actually begin at the end of this year. So, I mean, there, there's a fairly short time frame from when they're going to debut this to when the car is going to go into production. So I guess I wouldn't be surprised either way if they reveal the actual um, engine output at the reveal. One thing I'm curious about is the transmission because a lot of the Corvette faithful have been lamenting that there probably won't be a manual offered in the C8, at least right yeah. off the bat. Um, all the all the spy videos we've heard, I mean, you can clearly hear it's either an automatic or it's a dual clutch transmission. Um, and, right. and honestly, guys, a dual clutch transmission, you still get control over which cog you want, um, but it's just doing it so, so much faster than than you ever could i'm fine with the dual clutch transmission in that car um other things we've heard about active arrow we've seen all kinds a lot of patents yeah oh we've seen all kinds of patents showing various um you know active front splitters active rear spoilers active engine covers it's it just goes on and on and on the the kind of the the neat thing about that is most of these patents feature an image of a C7 Corvette. So, <laughs> yeah, that is funny. Yeah, well, you know, that, well, patents have spoiled the debut of many a car in the past. So they, I'm not surprised have. that that GM is is making sure that it doesn't happen this time. They have, and I think that could also be because we've seen these patents for a while. I think that could also be some of the source of the rumors where um, GM was going to build the C7 and the C8 side by side for a while. Um, it, it's that appears to not be the case. Um, the C7, actually, the C7 production is, uh, if it's not ended already, it's about to end. I think it wraps up July, later yeah, in July, I believe. Darn close to it. There's like yeah, a couple I, can't, of I couldn't see them left, I believe. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't see them selling them both or, or producing them both together uh, because honestly, just, you know, who who wants to buy a C7 when a when a mid-engine C8 is is right there? Well, when you um, when you look into the Corvette community, uh, it, it's it's a fascinating place to uh, to be because there are a lot of people that are upset. They are not happy that the Corvette's getting its engine oh, so you behind, think, behind the driver. So you think they maybe they could sell C sevens to purists who just don't want to acknowledge or accept the fact that it's going mid engine with no manual transmission? I I think there could have been an opportunity there to help show these diehard Corvette guys, the front engine Corvette guys, hey, we'll give you the front engine Corvette for a while while the mid engine is out, give you a chance to get used to it. But when you look through Corvette generations past, just about every new model launch, there's been a lot of that same push. Oh, of course. You know, of course. All, and, and right now it's like, well, we want our round taillights back. Well, you know what? <laughs> the C7 is is freaking amazing, you know? It's, right. It's, it's, they okay. probably want their pop-up headlights back too. Uh, yeah, yeah. When the, when the pop-up headlights went away, it's like, oh, yeah. that's not a real Corvette. But you know what? As the car comes out and people see that, hey, this is actually really good, a lot of that criticism drops away and and you know depending on how the uh the c8 goes i think you'll see that but then again the, this isn't just getting rid of pop-up headlights or round tail no, this, no, is, this, this is, is this is this is 
all a new baseball change. right here. Right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so we had some reports about um, that the C8 would have an untunable ECU. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Because that one was a little bit harder to follow, the kind of controversy over that. Well, and and really, the uh, I think it was the C7, at least with the ZR1, if not other C7 models, were, were supposedly going to have a, an untunable ECU. And I did a little bit of digging on that. Um, and at the end of the day, somebody will ultimately crack something. What I was, uh, what I was able to kind of dig up was that it seems like GM was getting a little tired of maybe some of their Corvette uh, owners buying their C7s, getting an aftermarket tune, throwing it in there, going out to the track, having some fun, maybe having too much fun and burning up a cylinder, then coming back to the dealership where admittedly a lot of the corvette buyers they're they're older they're a little bit higher in the income bracket they might have good connections at dealerships they might have high positions at dealerships so they had some kind of connections there to wink wink nudge nudge hey um can you uh throw the original tune back in this car and uh, and let's get it covered under warranty oh wow um I, I, the impression i had was that that happened quite a bit and really, dealerships are kind of the first line of defense for manufacturers when it comes to warranty claims like that. So to kind of circumvent that happening, the engineer said, OK, we're going to we're going to tweak this ECU. So it's it's basically untunable. And from what I've gathered on the C8, supposedly, if you try to upload a fresh tune, it basically wipes out all the programming in the ECU. So then it just bricks to, the car. Yeah. Yeah. It bricks the car. Wow. Then you have to go. Um, to GM, to the dealership, they'll reflash it with a stock tune and that's it. And I think you're right that somebody will eventually figure out how to get around that, how to tune it. But oh, definitely. Um, it, it we can is, count on the aftermarket for anything. It is that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean, these are the, this is the same community that, you know, jailbreaks iPhones. Uh, it, it happens eventually, <laughs> right? Right. You know, they well, and, that's, and that's what happened with the ZR1. I think Hennessy finally broke the uh, uh, ZR1. Um, mm -hmm. after after about a year or so. So w when you say untunable, you know what? It's not going to be as easy as a, as flashing up your Mustang for an extra 100 horsepower, but people will figure it out. So let's we mentioned the name a little bit before. Uh, we Like we said, we don't know if we'll, it'll the, the base model will be called the Stingray or it could be called the Zora after the father of the Corvette. But uh, some other names, what are some other names that have been floated around? I mean, are we going to are we going to lose Grand Sport as the step up from the, the base model? Is the R1 going to come back around? Name is something that we haven't really heard a heck of a lot about. A lot of people in the Corvette community want Zora to be in there, and Zora is actually trademarked. Of course, Zora refers to uh, uh, you know the father of the Corvette back in the in the '60s that he, that he was really the one that championed the, a lot of the great Corvette models of that era and the mid-engine design. So a lot of people want that name to be affixed to the Corvette somehow. Our current info tells us that the base model should be called Stingray. That's going to stick with what the current carry over. Yeah, yeah, it's going to stick with what that the current model is. That would a little bit. Why is just that? to differentiate between the two generations. I don't know. I mean, I have nothing to refute what you just said, but that would surprise me a little bit. Like I kind of agree. As you just it seems like an, it. It seems like a going good time between to make those a two generations and how yeah. they're sort of each have their own very distinct character that they would do something to differentiate the two a little bit more. Well, I mean, you you're certainly not wrong there. I would say taking some baby steps, so to speak. And I, and I say that with air quotes because they're moving the engine behind the driver. There's nothing baby step about this. But if you can offer a little bit of commonality there, I, I don't know, I, I think Stingray would be a, a, good, a good place to start with the, with the base Corvette. We've heard some reports that say that should happen. Of course, nothing is confirmed yet. We've also heard reports that Zora will appear at some point. Zora could become the the top dog Corvette, the thousand horsepower uh, hybrid that could come out here in the next few years. Other names, um, honestly, I haven't really heard much uh, with regards to other names. I haven't, I haven't heard anything about if, if ZR1 or Z06 will come back. I would expect to see a mix of familiar names and some new names like Zora. Uh, yeah. I mean, ZR1, ZR1 might be done. I would actually be very happy if, if the ZR1 moniker was done because I mean, that was always the king of the hill, the big top dog front engine Corvette. Now is a great opportunity to retire ZR1 and make Zora the new high end. And you could have Z06 still be a good mid-level car. You could have Grand Sports 
but yeah, maybe I, be like, I, yeah, the touring car. Um, maybe I should go out and buy that C4 ZR1 I've always wanted to buy. Oh, uh, do it, John. The price would go up. Uh, the evaluation would go up if they if they couldn't <laughs> stop using the ZR1 name. Don't tempt me. I, I want one of those too. I know. Yeah, you've I been know. eyeballing those for a while, both of you. I know that that are that are a first gen Viper. Um, I've always just that would be the coolest thing to own. Um, let's talk about price because and and you know we we. We should preface this by saying we don't know uh, any hard info on the price, but if you look at the current C7 entry level uh, price, uh, the base price is about fifty five thousand nine hundred. Right. I, I I find it hard to believe that they would be able to keep the starting price of the base Corvette uh, the same as the C7. I would have to expect that's going to go up, and my guess would be like in the sixty five to seventy range. Right, and. That's that's what reports and rumors are really telling us right now. Um, I remember earlier this year there was um, uh, one of the forums. Um, a person claimed to be an insider was saying that it was going to start at like 170 grand and all these things, and that kind of sent people into an uproar. And it started some rumors back then that oh, the Corvette, the mid-engine Corvette, is going to be uh, just just ridiculously high priced. But no, I, I agree with you, John. Uh, to keep this. To keep buyers interested, especially with this first step into the mid-engine realm, and to keep it competitive, uh, because when you talk a little bit about competitors, which we can do more later, um, that sixty-five to seventy thousand range, it's a step up from the current Corvette, but it still keeps it within reach of some of us mere mortals. Not all. Now, I do think there's a possibility that it might jump to like 80 or 90. I don't think that's out of the realm of possibility because this is such a, a big change for the Corvette. And if you look at some, like, like well, we can talk about competitors now. I mean, look at the Audi R8. Like that that starts at $170,000. Um, now, mind you, it starts with uh, 562 horsepower engine. So right. it's mid-engine exotics that, you, that come to mind, you know, uh, Uricon or an R8, those are putting down more power potentially than this entry-level Corvette will. Right, for certain. Right. And and I don't think um, I don't think the Corvette is going to come out at 170 thousand. However, you know, if we're talking about a a mid engine car with around 500 horsepower, I could imagine 80, 90 thousand for that. But they're just going to have to convince people that it's worth it because everyone's used to the Corvette starting at around you know 55, 60. Um, they're gonna have to show us that it's worth it if they want to raise it that high. Um, I th- to me this is to me this is one of the biggest un- unanswered questions that I think will affect the reception of the C8 debut. Is and, what is the base price going to be? Right. And I wouldn't be surprised if Chevrolet, if, if execs at Chevrolet are still kind of scratching their heads a little bit about okay, exactly where is this going to fit? Who are we going to line this up against? Because right, the Audi R8, Porsche 911, Carrera, th- those have kind of been traditional competitors although the r8 is is way up there in price uh what's what's a new 911 carrera is it isn't that around 80 70 80 somewhere around there i'm checking By right the time now you put any options on it you'll hit the six figures in fact i think it starts no it starts over six it starts, starts at 113 oh really okay it's yeah. even more than i thought what about um like the new the new came in the, the oh no PT4. i'm sorry i'm sorry it starts on it starts at 91,000. i was looking oh, at the carrera, S. <laughs> the carrera S, yeah. you know john i mean the the more we look in, into this maybe there is a some i just think man like i said five like 500 horsepower mid-engine car for sixty-five thousand. that sounds like the screaming deal of the century. And I know that bang for your buck has always been a tenant of the Corvette, right? It's always been an incredible performance value, mm-hmm. but that, but, but and part that, of that has to maintain that they can't ditch that in the recipe. All but, they, but I'm saying there's room to like, there's room to go up now. They could, they, they could go to 80,000 and still be the best value in terms of mid engine, uh, sports cars, you know, like, and then of course you have the very captain obvious statement of you won't be able to buy one of these in the first six months for less than six figures. You're right. You're right. Although, of a dealer I mean, I'm sure they'll want to produce as many of, they're going to have that Bowling Green factory, you know, cr- you know, at 150% right. probably trying to meet demand. Well, here's um, a, here's a question you have to ask yourself that I imagine uh, Chevrolet execs are actually asking themselves. You have the current Corvette clientele front engine V8 driving the rear wheels, if this car goes to mid-engine, are those buyers now going to look more closely at, say, a Challenger Hellcat or a new Shelby GT500? 
to stick with that front engine or should we keep the price a little bit on the low side try to keep them in the corvette world and convince them that hey moving the engine from the front to the back is going to be a better thing for you you know that's I just i just think that the corvette brand loyalty it, my guess is that it's stronger than the loyalty to a front engine uh layout like like i think it's the loyalty is to the corvette brand uh and car overall, not to the fact that it's front engine rear wheel drive. See, this but is where we... some end, I think some of those people are going to go out and they're going to buy a C7 for an absolute song in the next couple of months, too, because you, I can imagine the dealers will be negotiating. Oh, yeah, they're, they're trying to cars. get rid of them as best yeah, they can Yeah, talk right about now. a performance bargain. A C7 Z06 is going to be wonderful. Right. And, and this is where we need all of you Corvette listeners to go to motorone.com, get into some of our articles and tell us, are you that loyal? Would you go if you're just, I just get like, like, you know, brand loyalty is just like, how could a Corvette person buy a Ford? How could a Corvette person buy a dot? Like I just, how could, how could Chevrolet move the Corvette engine behind the driver? You you're know? right. I, if it, you if know, it, it's, if it pisses you off that much, maybe you would uh, bail and, and go get a GT 500 or something, but I don't think uh, so. I don't. I, I think they'll stick with the brand. You're right about that, John. It's so. it's going to be fascinating going forward, no matter no matter how you look at it. That's it, that, that's what I'm excited about. It will and be. After yes. Corvette meetings and their cars and coffees, think of how much more time they have to talk about their car now that the engine has shifted location. Well, you know what's interesting? Next week, when the Corvette, when the C8 debut is happening out in California, I'm based in Rapid City, South Dakota, the Black Hills. The oldest Corvette gathering in the nation is happening here next week that I'm going to go visit. And I'm going to be talking to some of these guys firsthand to see their opinions on a new mid-engine Corvette. Let's get yeah, some reaction live from the ground. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You know, with thinking about competitors um, and pricing, um, the current ZR1 can already get above like 100, 160000 oh, or yeah, so. Yeah. So when you start thinking of the C8 Corvette and then some of the versions that are going to come later, um, whatever they're called, you know, all the way up to the rumored, you know, thousand plus horsepower hybrid version, um, those could, I mean, I, I would imagine, I would expect that one the, to crest 200,000 at that point, the Corvette, if it, if it hadn't been already with the current ZR one, it is swimming in the same pool as the Lamborghini Huracan, oh, as right. the McLaren 570S, as some of these really legitimate supercars at that, like, like to me, that's the biggest effect of the switch to mid engine is that it's creating a new, a new upper ceiling for the Corvette that's a lot higher than the than the old one was oh yeah um in terms both in terms of price and performance and expectations like everything just gets amped up to another level and you're um, right that's the sort of correlation that we have to look at here is the price jump will be warranted if this car can put the power down better if this application can get around a track better obviously i mean the zr1 currently has a million trillion billion horsepower and to some extent, it's uncontrollable. The way it is, the way the power hits the wheels, it, it doesn't work as well as it could. So now you kind of start from the drawing board, put the engine in the middle. What is GM able to do with it? Are the performance figures going to rival that of a Lamborghini, Audi R8, even entry-level McLaren? If so, the price uh, price jump is warranted, I think. I, I definitely think one of the reasons for this switch is overall performance like on the track, because obviously a mid-engine layout is ultimately better for those situations and and corvette and chevy they go racing they go racing in a lot of different series with the corvette uh not the least of which is Le Mans, mm -hmm. and and winning there is so important to them you know what comes to mind to me too the ford gt so you know ford comes out with basically this supercar out of nowhere it's mid-engine they immediately go after winning Le Mans, and they do now chevy is coming out with a mid-engine version of the corvette and they're going to do the exact same thing they're going to go hard at all the racing series, try to win all the big races, all the big endurance races. I don't think the, the the Ford GT is ultimately going away fairly soon. I think we have the, isn't the last version, the the GT Mark II that was debuted uh, at the Goodwood Festival of Speed last week. That's the last version. Well, it's certainly not going away on a racetrack. You just said that and you're right. I mean, and now Chevy's going to have a more competitive car to go up against them at Le Mans. Well, I will say the... The only way the Ford GTs will stick around on the racetrack is through privateers. Right. Um, you know, the, the the factory effort will go away. So it, to me, it's kind of a bummer that the Ford GT and the mid-engine Corvette don't line up 
a little better and they're only going to overlap just a little bit both on the road in terms of like you know sales and 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 how they perform on the road but also competing against each other on the track they're just going to they're going to miss each other a little bit we'll probably you know obviously we'll get some comparisons of them but it's fascinating that we we li- we're living in an age where two of the three american car companies have mid-engine supercars um of the caliber uh, that these two were going to be. Obviously, we know the the Ford GT's caliber is very well proven. We don't know the Corvettes, but I'm going to put my money down and say that Corvette uh, Chevy engineers probably did a pretty good job based on on what they've done with uh, the last few generations of the Corvette. They've all been stellar. One thing that has dogged the Corvette pretty much every generation is the quality of its interior. And that's another thing that we haven't gotten really any peek into uh, before the debut in terms of what is the interior design, what materials did they use, and what the build quality is. So Clint, when you're there next week in person, that's going to be, I think, something um, that we're most interested in hearing about right away. Is what's the interior like? Did they raise yeah. the the that? Did they raise it a level that they needed to? Past Corvettes just have not reached, including set, including the C7, right? Yeah. To set Chris up a little bit here, I, I recall a few different spy shots where we saw uh, a peek through the windows, and two things stuck out to me. One is we saw paddle shifters on the steering wheel to sort of corroborate uh, what Chris mm-hmm. was saying with the automatic gearbox. And then two, sort of a long single row of buttons uh, alongside the infotainment screen. So it looks like they did a pretty hefty redesign oh, yeah. to separate this car from the C7. But you know, material quality, things like that, we're completely left in the dark until we get around and play with it. I, I see this giant row of buttons and my curiosity is certainly peaked with the way the cabin actually does look in person. And and to go along with that too, we heard a rumor and and this is this is a very kind of out there rumor. We haven't been able to really back it up at all. But it was mentioned on on one of the forums, I can't remember uh which forum it was on, uh that there might be like a, a sort of a posh GT version of the Corvette that comes out eventually that's going to be more upscale, almost uh, maybe sort of like the uh, the new McLaren GT where mm-hmm. it's where it's going to be a little softer on the suspension, it's going to be more plush inside, it's going to offer that upscale experience. That's just a complete far out rumor but it's interesting that that rumor even came up in the first place because i mean the corvette interiors they've gotten better over time and i never thought they were terrible but when you look at at, at other performance cars uh, of a similar vein i mean yeah it was they're a little, little too they, much plastic on the stingrays i think they're fine when you start to get into the z06 and the zero one territory where you're paying six figures then you're looking at the guy over in the audi or the porsche and being like Ugh, yeah my my plastic switch gear isn't as nice as their plastic switch gear um so so yeah we'll we'll definitely be interested to hear your take firsthand uh when you're able to sit in one next week um man Hopefully you know they'll so, let us sit in one <laughs> yeah yeah exactly we don't even know if they will i'm i'm looking i'm i'm scrolling right now through all of our spy photos of the C8 Corvette and we've been writing about um C8 Corvette spy photos for so long we have multiple <laughs> posts on spy photos of it being towed away when it's broken down like that's how that's how many spy photos have been shot like spy photographers follow this thing so regularly and incessantly that they catch it even when the cars break down and have to be towed by a tow truck well and even Um, better than that though yeah the professional spy photographers are out there but I can't remember a car where we've received and we've seen oh so many reader tips yeah reader tips and just and just fan videos uh, of out, you know, around cars and coffee, and oh, there's a Corvette or a Corvette going around a corner. There was a video where a guy was just like, uh, "Oh, oh, check it out, check it out!" I mean, he was just totally excited. It was like, like <laughs> yeah, right, and that makes it flip of this camouflage car, and it's just, yeah, man, off the hook. This is off the hook. Yeah, I, I'm super can't wait. So, all right, Clint, let's move on to talk about what next week will be like. Tell us. Tell us what you can about the debut event that's happening. Uh, well, the bar Thursday. is just a little high, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. No <laughs> just a little bit of excitement surrounding this event. So as I have the invitation in front of me, I can say with confidence that we both know a lot and absolutely nothing at the same time. Um, the invitation itself says the word Corvette. It has the logo that we're all accustomed to, and it says 7, 18, 19 with the number 8 highlighted in red, obviously to 
to bring clarification to the fact this is the eighth generation Corvette. It doesn't say C8. It doesn't say Zora. Clean and simple, right? It, it leaves the rest to imagination. Uh, as Chris mentioned previously, it's in Southern California. The flights are booked and we're going there. But beyond that, all we really know is it's a quick agenda. Uh, there will be a live stream. That's probably the most important part of this is around 8 o'clock p.m. I'm seeing per the invitation, uh, California time, that is West Coast time, 8 o'clock, that the event will begin. And so it's going to be late on the on the East Coast. That's right. Like that's 10, right. 30, 11 on the East Coast. But and we, we encourage you to stay awake for a couple of reasons. One, you can watch that live stream from the comfort of your home. You do not need to be in California to get the same information we do as journalists as it's happening. The event will be live streamed. Uh, and then right after that, we will be going to battle, throwing elbows as much as we can to get inside of these cars to put as much as we can. So please follow along uh, at social media and then check motor1.com as well. Uh, on Instagram, it's at motor1.com and the same for Twitter. So we will be flooding all of our social media with the information as we get it, getting up inside of these cars. And we will um, have um, we will have the live stream on Motor One next Thursday. And right. we'll also publish instructions and details about it early in the day. So it'll be um, available and ready for you to kind of open in a tab and, and wait um, anytime next Thursday. That's right. And then most importantly, we'll have our first video footage uh, of the car in person as well. And that will be going up as soon as we can get it cut together. So you're talking late East Coast for sure. Uh, but prior to midnight on the West Coast time, we'll have our first video look as well. And that's available on MotorOne.com and then also on the YouTube channel, which is at MotorOneUS on YouTube. Um, one other detail I do have on the event that's kind of cool to me is it looks like prior to the actual unveiling of the car and the technical presentation, for two hours there is, it says, the Corvette Corral and its owner's celebration to showcase cars. So this is a celebration. This is a look back at history for Chevrolet. Um, and not only is it a very important unveiling, obviously, it's a full-on celebration where they look to be inviting owners and important people to the brand, Corvette clubs, etc. cetera. Um, so there looks to be some sort of display going on prior to the unveiling well, of the car. Well, and to me, that's one, that's one good strategy of getting the Corvette faithful on board right. with your switch to mid-engine, right? It's, it's bringing them along. It's celebrating them at the debut. That's, that's smart. And and it we is. do know, I mean, just seeing um, from some of the different forums, I know some of the, I think the mid-engine Corvette forum.com guys, at least one of them, Chevrolet gave him an invite. So having that enthusiast connection involved is going to be key to make sure the Corvette people that aren't necessarily on board with the mid-engine design get on board. So, I mean, bravo. I, I got to give Chevrolet credit all around and GM uh, for the way they've done this launch. We've seen so many things that are overhyped in the past that kind of let down uh, I, do, I feel like they've just done this right from, from square one. It is overhyped, but I can't even blame GM for that. Yeah, I mean, right. It, exactly. It, can, we are driving the hype machine here. Uh, they've done the right thing by playing it cool. So as much as we can show you, we will be able to show you. Uh, so, and we will. So at the event, like I said, uh, at Motor1.com on Instagram and Twitter as well, we will be covering our social media with as much mid-engine Corvette content live from the ground as we can. So we are going to keep writing about the C8 Corvette in the six or seven days between now and the debut next week. So we're going to be talking about it more. We hope you join in uh, the discussion on the comments on motor1.com. And you can also join us to talk about it on Facebook and Twitter. Like Clint said, our handle is at motor1.com. Not only be talking about this up until the debut, this is going to we're going to be talking about the C8 Corvette for another, I think, year and a half until they, <laughs> they debut all the versions of it. Coming up, we're going to find out uh, what the three of us have been driving this week. But before the break, uh, I want to remind everyone that if you're listening to this online, you can also get our show on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Uh, so please hit the subscribe button now so you never miss a show. Welcome back. Uh, during this part of the show, we talk about what cars we're driving this week. And today we're going to start with Clint. Uh, Clint, what are you driving this week? We have an exciting one. We have the 2019 Ford Raptor. Crowd oh, very right? nice. Um, I can tell you a little bit about how it drives. This is a car that, or truck rather, that most people are familiar with. But all the stuff we know and love is there. 450 horsepower, 510 pound-feet of torque, 10 speed transmission, all these different modes, sport mode, Baja mode. You can shift it yourself with paddle shifters. It's wild. Oh, um, so fun to drive. I, 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 I got to drive it recently uh, as well. And 
not only fun to drive, but just in a completely different way than a, than a car, right? It, or, or even a sport truck that that's like a, like a, like a, a road, you know, uh, sports truck. It's, the, it's just, uh, insane to drive i absolutely love it what i i heard that um part of miami uh flooded this week from some heavy <laughs> yeah. rains did you get to go um do get some rooster tails up in that we had some crazy flooding uh the way we divvied up the cars that day i was actually in our long-term mazda cx-5 which handled everything just fine i should add and um but driving that car and then getting into the raptor is just hilarious. I mean, especially in <laughs> Miami where this, the street lanes are smaller and the streets are more compact in general. You are taller, wider, and longer than every car around you. And, and that si- it's, it's insane. Driving it through a city, it doesn't make much Honestly, sense. Honestly, I think that's true everywhere with the Raptor. I live in a suburb and when I drove it, it, it you feel like you're like you're driving something outsized for the road. Like you're, like you're yeah. six inches away from the white stripes on either side of you. That said, the things that stick out to me, the 10-speed transmission, really smooth, really well thought out, um, and beyond that, just the way it handles itself for being how big it is. But in addition to the normal how it drives, a couple quick things I wanted to share with you guys that I just found to be absolutely hilarious. MSRP for this thing, $73,200, which... A lot of money, no questions I think that's asked, a steal. I think that's a bargain what? for what it is. It's a lot of I truck. I totally do. It's, it's, a, okay. it's a cool truck, but it's a truck. Come on. If you don't if you don't like that, you can go buy a first-gen uh, Raptor, which is still a great truck, for like under 20. Like the, the prices have dropped yeah. really low. There's some, there's some very affordable ones out there. Right. Less powerful, but still a great truck. So we're starting at 55840 for the base, and we have $15,720 worth of options, and that includes the... $9,300 uh, very coolly named Equipment Group 802A, which includes things like the Bang & Olufsen sound system, voice-activated mm-hmm. navigation, uh, 360 cameras, so a whole host of things. That makes a lot of sense to me. But my other two favorite priced-out options here, we have the Raptor Exterior Graphics Package, which is Raptor it. in giant letters <laughs> across the it. side of the truck. The least subtle option you can find. $1,100 for that for some Ooh. stickers. And then two, to counter that point, I thought a very reasonably priced option, second row heated seats, $125. That is uh, that's quite reasonable. Affordable. Right. Thank you, right? Yeah. So I'm giving the Raptor some credit. The most obscure option I can find, $125 for rear heated seats. Those are the two that stuck out to me on our particular test vehicle. I'd still Ford get the Raptor, graphics. I love it. In a segment of one. There, there's nothing that that competes with the Raptor. There are other trucks that have that are jacked not up, yet. We're looking at but, you, Ram. Well, we'll see. Even when the Ram comes out with the Hellcat powered, um, uh, I always forget the name of it. The Rebel the R- TRX. 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 Yeah, yeah. Even with, like, is that going to be as much of a, um, an off roader? And when I say off roader, I don't mean uh, rock crawling. I mean, I mean dune jumping. Is it going to be yeah. as much of a performance high performance off-road vehicle as the raptor is or is it just going to be kind of a novelty of we stuffed the giant engine in this jacked up truck and I, we'll see i don't know but the truck is so good to start i have high hopes for they're taking their time with it too i think they know they exactly are. what they're doing and it will be a a worthy competitor when the time comes they are they are all right um chris what are you driving this week well speaking of things that might be a little bit high on price um some of our readers or listeners might know i've been considering Switching up my 2004 Mazda 6 for a brand new Kia Soul. And uh, I drove the, I went ahead and drove the GT Line Turbo. Um, I, I drove the uh, the X Line. I like the X Line, looks better. But, and John, we've talked about this in the past. It's disappointing that Kia doesn't offer more options on the, uh, on the X yeah. Line. Um, so I thought, well, let's take a look at the Turbo. More power is never a bad thing, right? And I got to be honest, I was really disappointed with the with the turbo. It's the 1.6 liter turbo. Um, it's got the dual clutch transmission. The transmission, I, I'd love the transmission. Uh, it felt great in that car, but just the the power difference really was negligible. I found between that and the the X line, which I th- really? which I think is the two liter turbo. I mean, you fe- or not? not it's, it's a non turbo. It's a, just a two liter engine. Um, it's, I mean, there's a little bit more oomph to it, but it's just, it's not enough to satisfy. And, uh, and it's not enough no. to justify the, the, the Kia Soul that I drove was $29,000. That's a lot. For yeah, people. they're expensive. I remember I did the first drive for that car back in February 
And I remember driving that dual clutch and that model, the the higher spec of the two GT line models. And I was impressed with it. But, you know, once you start putting in those components into a little hot hatch, you're asking it to compete with the GTI, even if it's indirectly. Yep. And it wasn't quite that level, but it's a very capable car. Your point about the X line is completely right that they don't offer the biggest infotainment screen the best sound system you cannot spec an x line to the nines honestly i would just i would just like better seats I, i'm not really enthused about the seats in the x line the gt turbo mm. I, I i love the seats in the gt turbo i felt it was a little bit more comfortable overall in that respect uh, yeah. but just the 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 price is just too much for not getting enough excitement out of it and if you want to talk about turbo lag oh you, you need to keep that in the right gear. Otherwise, you roll on the gas, and uh, uh, that 1.6 just, just doesn't go anywhere. You know, I haven't I haven't driven the new Soul with the turbo engine, but I did drive the last generation uh, Soul with the turbo engine, and I believe the engines are are the you know practically the same. Just about um, yeah. And I honestly I remember thinking uh, the same as you, Chris, where the difference in power, um, even though on paper it seemed somewhat large, it didn't I didn't really feel it as as much as I thought I would on the road. And and part of it is because even if it is a 200 plus horsepower engine, I mean this isn't a GTI. This this isn't a car that is meant to be um a, a sports car or a hot hatch um you know it's got a little bit of ground clearance it's a little bit top heavy mm -hmm. um so uh, i a, a faster a larger engine more power faster performance doesn't just it just doesn't feel like it gets used properly in the the kia soul turbo i've always been fine with the two liter engine that's the one we had or had in our um 2014 kia soul and have has have always felt it's more than adequate like it's it never right st it never stood out as not being powerful enough with plenty powerful enough plenty uh civilized enough and all of that so and that's but, and that's how i felt as well it's it's just the the x line does everything i need and i just i just wish it had some more equipment and i've kind of because of all this i've kind of talked myself out of a soul now i, I mean it's, it's still in my well, mind and that's why i i think they're getting a lot of feedback both from critics and probably from consumers um i would I would I would expect that to change for the next model year. I don't know. Are you are we driving the 2019s? Um, it, I, no, I, I think it's the 2020. The, are they 2020? The, yeah, yeah right, then maybe yeah, we'll have to wait. So. We'll have to wait a while longer. I, I think when when 2021 comes around, they're going to change the um, equipment levels for the X line and mm -hmm. offer offer more options. It doesn't make sense to not give people what they want, especially when they're willing to pay for it. Right. So. And and the twist to all this is now I'm I'm kind of looking at uh, at a Honda Civic Si. I haven't driven one yet. But uh, mm. there are some interesting, uh, I found some interesting lease deals for a Civic Si. Um, I don't know that uh, if, if I'd go with the sedan or the uh, or the coupe, but that's that could On be a, a possibility. I, I've never met a disappointed Civic owner, so, you know. True. Um, all right. So this past week, I had to give the keys back for uh, the McLaren 720S Spider <laughs> I was driving last week. Yeah, it's pretty pretty sad. I had some fun with it. Um, and this week, I accepted the keys to a 2019 Hyundai Kona. Uh, it is the ultimate front wheel drive edition. I've had it a few days. I've driven it around. And it's interesting that that you're driving the Soul, and we just talked about that. I mentioned that my wife and I have owned a Soul for a long time. This is like Hyundai's version of the Kia Soul. Um, and I, I like it because it has a kind of quirky personality in the same way the Soul does. Like the Soul has a completely different look, but the Kona's look is also a little bit outside the mainstream, right? It has It has some character and personality to it, so I like that. That said, this is $28,680. So this is a, a high-end version. Yeah, that's steep. Uh, it, yeah, for, for what it is. And I don't know. I, I've been more impressed with the Soul uh, when it's been optioned out um, and fully loaded than I am with this Kona. It just doesn't seem to quite match it. And, you know, I, I don't know. I don't expect that much from kind of the from from a car like this like an economy car uh, in terms of performance but usually these kind of cars are pleasant enough to drive around town you know in in 35 five mile per hour zones this one it just doesn't even have it doesn't even feel like it has the pep or the the sprightliness to make uh even you know some low speed just daily driving pleasant 
Um, it feels much more appliance like. So right now, my first impression is is that it's long on looks, but but kind of short on substance. So I've got uh, another half week to spend with it, though. So uh, I'm going to take it out uh, for a photo shoot this afternoon. So that'll let me inspect it a lot closer. But yeah, so far I'm kind of it. It, it hasn't. Uh, I haven't warmed up to it um, as much. And it could be I'm going to have to work against my my Kia Soul bias, right? Because you know, being an owner, you always have that that urge to make yourself uh, justify the purchase decision you made <laughs> by always loving and defending the car you made, uh, the car you purchased. Um, so I'm going to have to work past that a little and give this one a fair shake, but um, I think I can do it. Um, it just maybe needs to work a little harder to meet me halfway. You know, and that's kind of how I felt on the soul too. I, I started asking myself, am I going to regret not having better options in this car? And just the thought of that, the fact that I'm thinking about it was a little discouraging. It's like, well, if I'm, sure. if I'm already asking about it now, you, know, you should be able to get the exact one you want. Yeah, you know, yeah. the fact that they're they're just not letting you because they don't offer those options on that trim level is, you know, annoying. Yep. And and I even thought about uh, I thought about the Hyundai Kona too, but I I'm just not on board with the modern trend of these big, huge trapezoid grills. I just I I had, there isn't one that I've been able to warm up to yet. And I'm just I'm looking at the Kona right now, and I'm just thinking. Yeah, that looks like a big whale sucking down some fish. <laughs> yeah, and like I said, it's not for everybody. But you know, when the Soul came out, it wasn't for everybody too. Right. I think that a lot of people have warmed up to the Soul over time, seeing it everywhere, seeing those uh, mouse commercials or hamster hamsters. commercials. Sorry, hamsters. The, the hamsters. hamsters. Um, yeah, so that that always helps. A good marketing campaign behind it. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of our show this week. Um, you can follow Chris at ch writing on Twitter, and Clint, what's your Twitter handle? Uh, at Clint Simone and then Instagram at Clint underscore Simone. Ah, that's very um, obvious, which is good for you. I couldn't get my own name. I had Makes to, it easier that way. Huh? Exactly. On Twitter, my handle is John underscore M underscore Neff, uh, which is a pain in the ass to write when I'm typing it. <laughs> um, but I want to thank you guys, you two, for being here. Um, thanks for joining me this week. Oh, it's always a pleasure. Thanks for having me. And also thank you all about there for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye.